Our webinar today is sponsored by PASA and the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship, along with the Pennsylvania Grazing Lands Coalition. Today's webinar is going to be on integrating grazing and improving the bottom line on the family dairy. My name is Matt Bumgardner. I, I own Blue Mountain View Farm in Anvil, Pennsylvania. Feel free to uh, send me emails if you have questions. I am the chair of the Grazing Coalition. And as part of the coalition, we help mentor and advise other farmers. We report our time to NRCS. So by helping you, I can report that time to the NRCS, and they know that grazing is being communicated and there's questions being asked about grazing. So this is my family, uh, my wife Amy, my daughter Brooke is eight, my son Braden is five, and my daughter Kylie just turned three years old. We try to have our children help out. Uh, you can see Brooke milking. Braden there in the bottom is cleaning out a, a grain drill with a vacuum, and he loves doing that stuff. So our, we don't work our kids too much by any means, uh, but we like to get them involved and help them to, to feel important to our operation. Our farm is located in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And recently, Lebanon went through a time of uncertainty. Uh, some producers were being dropped by a, a large milk co-op or large milk company. And, uh, you know, today's milk environment, dairy environment, is very tough. Uh, it seems like we're being told we need to make more milk, and it's not really helping in a, in a time of oversupply. It might be helping an individual farm, but it's not helping... Uh, the industry. But today we're going to talk about integrating grazing on the on the farm and this is going to help you make more money, save more money, and at the same time not contribute to an oversupply of milk. So we started grazing in year 2000. Uh, my dad and my uncle split a partnership and my dad did not have the equipment. Uh, he had more land and all the, all the dairy cows so he decided to add grazing. I returned to the farm in 2005, and in 2008, we considered expansion. Uh, we are looking at it. The, I was comfortable going to 120 cows. We're, we were at maybe 80 or 90 at the time. But my accountant said that uh, I need to keep the, the new facility uh, under $3,500 per cow. And he said it'd probably be better to go to 150 cows. And the numbers look better, but it was very difficult to build a facility for that price. So we decided not to do that and instead build a, a parlor for our existing facility. Uh, in, in very early 2009, we started milking in that new parlor. I also bought the cows in 2009. And then uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but bought the farm in 2012. And in 2015, we started the organic transition. So if you know the, the dairy economy, 2009 was the worst year ever, 2012 was the second worst year, and 2015 is what's the start of what would be the, probably the toughest period of dairy farming. So I've had uh, trials uh, getting into the industry, even though I, I'm coming onto my parents' farm, and it's, it's taught me to, to spend my money correctly, and uh, when the times are good, to enjoy those times and to invest my money correctly not buying uh, new equipment or, or spending for things I don't need. This is an overview satellite of the farm. Uh, the pasture right here is the original 30 acres started in 2000. Uh, at some point, 2006 or seven, we may have built this little heifer pasture. But in 2008, we built this uh, 12 acres right here. This is uh, part of the, the expansion that we, when I came back to the farm uh, in 2005, my dad was milking 60 cows and we quickly took it up to 80, 90, 100, so we needed more acres. Uh, the, the yellow here was a 40 acre pasture that we added in 2012 that doubled our grazing at the time, took us to 80 acres. And then the purple here was added in 2013. In the fall of 2012, I, I put oats in this, this field at the time and we cut it, and it cost me $2,000 to cut 
bale and and wrap the the forage. I think we got about a hundred bales off of that. And I said for that cost, uh, with a little help from uh, NRCS funding, I could spend that much and put up a, a pasture fence that would last for 20 plus years. And since uh, 2013, we've added this section here. This is a power line that was put in, up in the 70s, uh, a high high voltage power line. So we reclaimed that from uh, invasive uh, Atlantis tree of heaven trees and locusts. We, it's now a, a grass paddock. And we also allow grazing into the upper and, and lower woods. And for 2018, we're working on permits to get cross streams to get to this field back here. Uh, the field on the, on the north side of the farm is pretty hilly. And the road along the, the back side, I do not trust uh, putting a fence along. People always seem to be getting off that road. And I don't want to be fixing a fence or having cows getting out. We're 96 milking cows, and as of 2015, we have a 65-pound average with a 4-1 fat and 3-2 protein. The, I chose 2015 for this webinar because this is right before we started the organic transition. I, I didn't want to talk about uh, the transition as it pertains to organic. I wanted to keep it conventional for the farmer that's trying to get into grazing from a, a conventional uh, non-organic uh, system. To be transparent, uh, this is the production since this uh, since 2015. So this would be February 2015, where we were about our milk, even uh, later that year. And this point right here in, in 2016 of August is when we stopped feeding corn silage. Uh, we decided not to grow corn silage organically, and you can see the, the drop in production. And this point right here is the end of conventional feed, we went to organic feeding. Uh, we had to drop cotton seed and a few other things like rumensin and um, milk ma making additives. Furthermore, we had to work with poor forage. Both years, the main crop has been forage sorghum and it's turned out pretty poor. So we're, we're battling challenges and right now uh, we're, we are down in milk. So getting back to 2015, our, our cell count average was 148,000, which it, uh, it's about that right now. 38% uh, call rate. Call rates are tough to really get a picture of the farm because for me, we used to keep every calf, and I don't really like selling replacement animals. I usually don't get the value I want for them, and I'm, I'm kind of a, a future-oriented manager. I'd rather sell that cow that's old that might only last another year and keep a, a young animal that has the, her whole future ahead of her. So we're, in 2015, we had a 49% 49 concept, 49 conception rate and a 19% preg rate. So preg rate would be every 21 days, what percentage will get pregnant? And by definition, it's a heat detection rate by the conception rate. Uh, right now, with the past year, we've, we've taken that up. Our conception rate is higher, and our preg rate's around 25%. And both both of these were in a bi-seasonal calving interval. So we don't breed for, for almost six or seven months out of the year, which means any open cow is just taking that preg rate down because she isn't being bred every cycle after the breeding window. The goals for the farm, we want to be profitable First and foremost, we want to maximize income over feed costs. Uh, we want to maintain a high stocking rate, and we'll get into this more later. Also, maximize labor efficiency. And then I, I want a lifestyle. I want a time for family. Family. I want a time for community, maybe for my church. I want to enjoy my life and being with my children. I have an uncle that told me, enjoy the moment you are with your children because you can't always be looking ahead to better times because at some point you'll be looking back wishing you had those uh, times when they were younger. And also want to uh, respect the environment so we keep our cows out of the stream. Uh, any riparian areas, we, we flash graze. We don't let the cows hang in a wet area. Uh, our wooded areas, I'm not looking to kill the entire vegetation. Uh, I want to keep keep the woods almost the way they, they were meant to be. And then we want to reduce tillage, herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizer. 
So all that stuff costs money, and it all affects uh, our soil in, in some ways or others and the, the wildlife around it. And then we also want to encourage wildlife, wildlife habitat. So our pastures, the, the, the deer love our pastures, groundhogs too. And we, this year we're going to maintain 39 bluebird houses and I probably will buy more or make more if uh, we get a good, good rate of uh, usage. So look at the profitability. Uh, first I need to talk about my grazing advisor, Dwayne Hertzler. So he's been very key in our profitability, uh, being able to bounce ideas off of given suggestions. So Dwayne is a retired dairy farmer from Perry County. Uh, he transitioned farm ownership to his son, Neil, in 2014. And he's still involved to some degree, but not in the, the, every, the everyday uh, milking or, or things like that. He's been hybrid grazing since 1994 and switched to heritage breeds in 2000. And basically a heritage breed is not a Holstein. I guess there's no real definition about it, but yeah, he's been crossbreeding. They, they've been using a number of Fleckley lately. And since uh, September 2017, they've been organic and they're shipping to Trickling Springs Creamery through Organic Valley. And there's a picture of Dwayne uh, that is from a field day last fall, that's a, a pasture of oats and tillage radishes. So our profit team, we started in 2011, and basically we started because the cash flow wasn't working, and there's a poor corn silage crop uh, harvested in August. The the yield, the, the insurance appraiser looked at it, he said it was nine bushels to an acre of corn. And Knowing having these two problems coming about, uh, I told my parents, you know, no use digging the hole anymore. I'm going to quit farming and look, look elsewhere. The decision didn't necessarily sit well with me. It, I was I was fine with my decision, but I thought I'd give it another try. So we started a, a profit team meeting or a profit team in, in uh, September, and we, we started out. We, we had the vet nutritionist accountant, loan officers, and a, a DHI lab tech. Uh, the extension agent we added uh, just recently. And then at the first meeting, Dwayne Herzler was not a part of it, but working with the Center of Dairy Excellence for, for the profit team, they had Dwayne available as a mentor. And the team at that first meeting decided if I was going to continue grazing, Dwayne would be a great addition to the, the profit team. So he soon started joining, and then since I've uh, started the transition or organic, we've had uh, Arden Landis help with organic consulting. And Arden is just as good about the organic stuff as Dwayne is about grazing, because there's so many things that he's helped me, Arden has helped me through the organic transition. And Arden also knows grazing too, so it's great having extra grazing advisors. Uh, at these meetings, we identified uh, bottlenecks. Uh, we had a large short-term debt, 9,600 annual payments, or 96,000 annual payments. It boggles my mind that we were making, paying that much on our loans, uh, but no wonder we had tr trouble with the cash flow. We have poor facilities, uh, small stalls and alleys, and our land is below average production. And these were not rocket science. I mean, it wasn't uh, mind mind opening when we came up with this. It's stuff we knew, but coming to the table and putting it all together uh, really helped us out. So here's some pictures of our, our small stalls and, and scrape alleys. Uh, this picture here on the left with a cow laying down, that that's kind of typical of what we used to deal with. Uh, we can't find a stall, we just lay in, lay in the slop. And then here on the right, you know, you can see how, how narrow our alleys were. It's a seven foot alley, I believe. Uh, the cows are, are perched a lot up on the stalls, so more weight on the back legs. This line back here is not a big animal, but you can see her, her hocks are off the, the back. And this Halstein here, her toes are barely on the mat and she's in there diagonal. You know, how is she supposed to sit down and get up without having problems? 
And then our, our soil type is a Burke shale, uh, well-drained. This picture doesn't show the, the hills we have, and some will have more hills, you know, but we can't grow corn and be successful every year. Uh, our average is 100 bushel of corn, and that's based over 10 years. I, I said we, we had a, a low of 9 bushel an acre. The year after that, we had 32 bushels an acre, and the year after that, we had 180 bushels an acre. So very random. If the rain comes when the corn's in tassel, we were able to make good corn silage. If not, we had a bunch of fodder. So we took steps to correct the bottlenecks. Uh, we refinanced the debt, debt with longer repayment terms. So my parents, being in their 60s, didn't want to have to take out loans for another 30 years. So it was the perfect timing to, to buy the farm from my parents. The facilities get the cows out of the barn. And we could do that through grazing and outwintering some animals. So we've been outwintering uh, older heifers or dry cows uh, over the winter. Since we've been doing this, probably I think for five winters now, we have not treated a single animal that's been outwintered. So if you have them in the barn, I, I think we the younger animals we might have had one or two that actually died in our, in our barn. So it was better for them to be outside. And then we, we decided to remodel uh, and we created a compost pack out of our free stalls. Uh, we were actually able to save money because I could sell the stalls for some money and the jackhammer I rented for a hundred bucks and all it was is breaking out some of the, the, the curves and making a flat surface to put uh, sawdust bedding on. In our land, we, we decided to increase our acreage for grazing and we decided to look for alternatives to growing corn. So here's our compost pack. This is my dad and my son on, on the skid loader. And this is a harrow that you drive backwards and basically plow the pack. There's a, a, a busted post there to help smooth it out. Uh, but this is a way to get the poop patties turned under. And uh, when you add fresh bedding, you don't have, you know, a a wet spot that that stays wet. Here's another picture. This is after sawdust was added. Uh, the pack can get wet, especially at the end of the end of the year, uh, March. It'll get really wet and sloppy till we can get the cows out. But we're adding bedding six or seven days a, a week, and uh, it's a bucket. We have a, a sawdust bucket. It probably holds it a yard and a half. So we're using about two to three yards of uh, animal bedding a, a day. And animal bedding is basically ground up skids. They pull the, the longer stuff for mulch and the finer, dustier stuff they we can use for bedding. It does better than, than shavings. Shavings seem to pack. This allows air in there and helps it to, to dry out. So showing two pictures of previously, you know, you can see the difference between the pack and the, and the free stalls. Uh, if I took a picture of what the cows are in the barn and they're full, uh, they'd all be laying down and enjoying it. So much different, much better cow health since we made this decision. So we looked at forage sorghum, and this chart here is a, from 2014 and 2015. Uh, 2014, we planted 99-day corn, and 2015, we did a 95-day forage sorghum. It was odd. They were planted almost the exact same day, harvested almost the exact same day, and the yield was exactly the same. Both times, we did a, a storage bag, and 200 by 8 feet is 200 tons, roughly, and both times, we couldn't add another load. We couldn't. We didn't need another load. So it's almost exactly the same. The, the difference between these two is that that forage sorghum costs about $150 an acre less to grow. Uh, seed is cheaper. I didn't need to have a custom operator come in with a corn planter. I did with the drill. And you can see it, it's not nearly as tall as corn, but it's just denser, more thick. So that was probably an 80,000 to 90,000 population. And yeah, it did really well. So looking further at profit, uh, Larry Turnell from Iowa State University has a, a formula, price minus cost times volume is profit. 
So looking at milk price, uh, you've heard it before, you know, we can boost it by components, quality bonuses, and niche markets. So organic or even grass-fed. I am not sold on the quality bonuses part of it because I feel you can really chase quality bonuses and only get about 20 cents for getting another bonus level. So if it's there, go for it. If you really have to fight to get low uh, sell counts, uh, I'm not sure how much it's worth it. We certainly want to be within the, the market standards and should they ever come along looking to drop farmers, uh, they might be going after those farms with high sell counts. So costs, for me, 66% of my cost is feed and 5% is milk hauling. So that shows you the difference of how important it is to, to cut our feed costs. Uh, you know, if, if there's a 61% difference between that and, and the milk hauling, the next closest expense. And then volume, we, we want milk per cow and cows per farm, stocking rate. So we'll look at these a little more. What, what this tells me is let's make as much milk as cheap as possible, income over feed costs. And again, this isn't rocket science, but, you know, how, how do we do this? So I'm going to look at grazing, increasing cow comfort, and looking at genetics, we, we want long-lasting cows and we want smaller animals. Uh, I believe it's Dr. Fry from St. Bridges Farm in Maryland. I listened to a webinar in 2008 that he put on. He milks jerseys and he, he said, a jersey cow will eat 80% of a Holstein cow. So looking at that, we can have the same amount of forage but we can add 20% more Jersey animals. So at that time, they were making the same income over feed costs. You know, what went in and what came out was almost the same in, in profit. So he said that's 20% more animals making him a profit. So looking at the smaller animals, and they seem to do a little better on pasture, but I sometimes wonder if it's more of a preference of the farmer. So also want to maximize stocking rate. So my, my farm, my, it's my bunk space that limits the herd to 96 cows. And my bedded pack, I said we, we have trouble at the end of the year. That's because I have enough pack for about 60, 65 cows. And we'll take it up to 96. So it, it's wet and we're adding a lot. But we're basically just trying to get through till, till spring, till the grass is ready. And if I want to maximize stocking rate, I'm going to buy in forage most years. And with the milk price, we decided to transition organic. Uh, but like I said, there, there's some things you can do if you choose not to pursue organic. So looking at hybrid grazing, we need to ask, what, what does it cost to score feed from, from 17 acres? So this is from 2017. Uh, we did five cuts, but uh, this, the first cutting, we did some other pastures. But the four cuts afterwards, we did all baleage and we did it all by itself. So it's very easy to, to figure out exactly what it costs. And I'll show a couple of slides with a bunch of numbers. Uh, if you have trouble, if it's getting you, you're reading ahead, you know, just close your eyes and, and listen uh, or, or try to follow along. So I, I basically here have the job and what it costs per acre or per bale. And then the totals at the end. And here at the bottom, you know, four cuts, 251 bales, it costs almost $25.50 a bale to, to make these baleage, make this baleage. And uh, if I had the cost to establish, which I figure is probably about $50 a year at least, it comes out to about $113 per ton. So that's very expensive. So what if I want to go graze it? So this is 18 pounds of dry matter, and we'll discuss a little later. 18 pounds is about the max that you can add of pasture without losing milk. And here on the left, we have our feed ingredient and the amount we're removing from a diet. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, my TMR in March and then compare it to a TMR in May when we're fully on this 18 pounds of grass. So here's what we, we remove of these feed ingredients. Here's the cost. Uh, some of these is a, a lower quality hay and grain, we're going to remove protein, so it's going to be a cheaper uh, grains uh, supplement. And when we add these all together, we get 200, 
or two dollars and twenty cents a day in savings over feed costs. But we also have to look at what does it cost to grow that pasture and maintain that pasture. So if we add a two cent cost per dry matter, it ends up saving us a dollar eighty four a day. So this comes out to about hundred and sixty dollars an acre cost per year. And this can cover things like your infrastructure, your fence, your fertilizer, your seed that you add, maybe even uh, clipping and any other maintenance issues. But that dollar eighty four cents, you know, our industry is telling us right now to make five more pounds of milk. So we're going to make forty five cents more milk, and it's going to cost us what is it going to cost? Twenty five cents, thirty cents. So we end up making fifteen cents profit. But this profit right here, this is worth about 12 pounds of milk at $15 a uh, hundredweight. Uh, it's a huge savings, but we, we don't look at that. We, for some reason, we want to produce more rather than producing less. But this $1.84 is real, and it, it, it can really save you a lot of money. If you have 100 cows, it's $184 a day. If you could graze for 200 days, you know, add it up. It, it really, really can add up. So when we add uh, grazing to a confinement dairy, we want to add the pasture without losing production or changing our management style. And I say changing management style, we don't want to have to really change the cows and change what we do. You know, that can come later, but right now we're just looking to make that $1.85 or $1.84 profit. So pasture is going to take up 15, 18 pounds of dry matter. Uh, production can increase slightly, uh, it really depends on how well you're feeding them in the barn. You normally don't lose any milk. Uh, feed cost is greatly reduced. Uh, less electric use, so we're not running lights at, at night or fans at night. We have less manure handling and hauling. We can eliminate bedding use because they may never be in the barn. Maybe during the summer, during the heat. Uh, it depends on your bedding system. My, my compost pack, it dries out in the summer, and we don't add bedding in the summer. You get better cow health, uh, better feet and locomotion, and you can reduce labor. There, there are problems. We, we can have that loss of production. Uh, basically, are the cows staying full? If your cows aren't staying full, they, they will lose production. Uh, they can have low body condition. Again, are they staying full? And low body condition affects the feet, which can re affect the reproduction, and they can have freshening problems. And then there's certainly the problem of acidosis. Uh, if you're re feeding some feed in a bunk and it's really full grain, uh, you can have some acidosis. Normally at 15 pounds, you shouldn't have a problem unless there's some other issues like they're really sorting the feed or the, maybe the bunk bottom is, is really coarse and they're able to sort it real, real easily. So looking at management, uh, we add pasture as ingredient in the feed ration and we adjust the ration. So I go to my nutritionist every spring, I tell them, hey, we're gonna to go to 10 pounds of grass, put that in the ration and adjust my my uh, grain and, and baleage and whatnot. And then he comes back to me with, with the ration. We start feeding that and as I'm building up to that 15 pounds, 20 pounds, I tell him, this is how much pasture I want, add it as an ingredient. So this way we, we aren't overfeeding protein and we're able to balance and yeah, not not spend too much but not make too too less of milk. We aim to keep cows in pasture as much as weather dictates. So this getting the cows out of the barn again. You need to allow extra time to bring the cows in the pat in from pasture to eat and or milk. And what we found is if we bring the cows in straight to milking, we have cows that stand at the back and wait, you know, they'll be getting milk last, and then they go to the bunk, and they might not have anything to eat because the cows before them ate it. Uh, and then even if there is some there, you know, the cows at the, the back of the milking schedule, they won't get as much to eat. The cows at the beginning will, will fill up, and they'll be full. So what we started doing is we bring the cows in before milking and allow them all to eat so they're all there at the bunk, all have equal opportunity. And then our barn, we are able to split them into to two sections, and we'll start milking one group, get them out. They can finish up eating. By the time they're done, the other group is done eating. They come in and milk. And then both groups go out to the pasture ready to eat more pasture. So it's we found 
that we could take that, that 15 to 18 pounds of dry matter and almost go up to 20 pounds without losing any production. And then you want to manage the pastures with the time you would spend making forages. So looking at pasture management and maximizing stocking rate. So our grazing management, our intake during the grazing season can top 50% of the diet, and that can be up to 24 pound, pounds of dry matter. Uh, this coming year with the uh, milk markets the way they are, and the still transition organic, we're probably going to push that as far as we can go. Uh, it's no use making cheap milk expensively. We start grazing at, at 10 to 12 inches. We want it not in head. We want a vegetative plant. And we remove the cows at residue height of, of 4 to 6 inches. And I say that remove them. We don't allow them to stay in there for a certain amount of time. We know how much they need. And if, if they're grazing everything at 6 inches, maybe in 8 inches, I'm not going to let them in there longer to take it down. We just move them on. As long as it's level and even and it can regrow at the same rate, I'm happy with that. They get fresh grass every 12 hours, so basically every time we move them in to milk, we change the paddock fence to give them more. And the time it takes to change the paddock fence, you know, those cows are walking in, so it, it's not like it takes that long to, to move wires. Uh, paddock rotation is anywhere from 14 to 45 plus days. The 14 days is usually a summer annual like sorghum sedan, and the 45 day rotation is usually during summer for the perennial, and we have gone higher. And then after October 1st, rotation goes to 60 days. And that, for us, is 10 pounds of grass is what we allow. Uh, this is one thing that Arden Landis got us doing. And basically, this is allowing the grass to store up root reserves for overwinter. And it allows us to lengthen our, our grazing into December. Uh, so that, that first grass is grazed October 1st, isn't grazed again till December 1st. And normally, middle to, to end of October is about the time that the grass stops growing. So it's, it's worked out really well, and I really recommend it for those that are limited on pasture. This is a, the map of the farm. So you can see that we have three fields on the outside, and then we have these, these paddocks. And we have uh, coordinates. So this is northeast one, northeast two, uh, southwest. You know, it's easy for me to go out and not have to look at a chart. Now, which which paddock is this? Uh, it's just the the direction away from the farm. And one thing we kind of stumbled on by accident, but it really is helping, is you see all these paddocks are about the same width. So when we go from a paddock like southwest two up to northeast two, I don't need to figure out how how much to give them, you know, it's a different width, so how much far into the pack do I give them? It, it's the same, and I know the block that they need. Uh, we have uh, improved lanes up through the middle, and then water all the way to the end of some of these paddocks. And they each are, are within about 500 feet maximum of, of water at all times. We divide our, our temporary, uh, our paddocks with temporary lines and movable brake lines. On the left here is step-in posts with a poly wire, and then on the right is uh, what they call tumble wheels. So a tumble wheel, you can go to one end and pull it, and these wheels will tumble after. Uh, that way you don't need to take down your line and put it back up. They're, they're best for very long and wide uh, paddocks. You don't want to have a narrow one. And if you pull the end more than 50 feet, it seems that these tumble wheels end up moving toward the middle, and then you need to respace them. It does take time to set up initially, but as you're moving them, you can save time because it's just moving the wire at the end. They are expensive, so don't uh, look at them too closely if you don't want to spend the money. I think it's $70 a wheel, and they're only aluminum. They can break easily if you have cows that want to challenge them. But they are electricized, so the cow isn't going to touch them with that shock. But you get a cow tangling on the wire, they, they can really break the tumble wheel. Our paddocks are 50% grass and clover. And you can see that what we're using there, I, I use multiple varieties of everything. Uh, I want to 
have different varieties, so in case my management favors one over the other, I have something that, that comes. And we're based on orchard grass. I'm starting to re reintroduce some ryegrass. Uh, either love one or hate the other, it seems like. And I like orchard grass more in the, the summer, but I like ryegrass more in the spring. So uh, we try to have a mix, and we're, we're starting to do more meadow fescue, but it is an expensive seed. And then the clover, I, I mostly prefer the red varieties because they have a, a deep tap root, a little more high, highly yielding. And the white can seem to take over a pasture if it's uh, undergrazed a little bit too much. And then I add forest chicory to my mixes. Uh, cows and deer, they, they love that stuff. Uh, but it does go to head, and it can make the pastures look like the full weeds to people that don't know what forest chicory is. So old grass and weeds, well, what do we do with that? So here's a paddock that that's, uh, you know, it's in head. It looks like their seed head develops. This is what I graze the, the dry cows and heifers with. I find it's easier to control those animals on, on higher grass. I don't have to worry about them overgrazing. Or it seemed like my heifers certainly would take certain areas down to the ground and leave the other grass go. So by doing this, it they graze more uniformly. And weeds, maybe it's because I'm going organic, but uh, I find that if you need to spray weeds, it's a symptom of overgrazing or a stand density that is lacking. Uh, if you can graze properly and have a dense stand, there's no room for the weeds to grow. And cows will eat many weeds, even some Canadian thistle at certain times I've seen them eat it. They, my cows aren't starved, you know, they, they voluntarily chose to eat that, those Canadian thistle. Uh, so my concern is mostly keeping them from reseeding themselves, and I do that with the mower. Uh, so come in and, and clip, and it knocks them back, the, the reseed, if they have a chance to regrow and set seed, it's not going to be as, as good as it was. But certainly pigweed and lambs quarter cows will actually go after that first sometimes. We, we look at how many species. So you've seen some of the stuff that I've been doing. And this is from a slide from Penn State. Increasing the species in the field helps improve the, the function, but there becomes a point where it, it's not as great as it was before. So I, I try to add a, a few different types of species and, and types of plants, but I'm not going to go too crazy. Uh, I feel at some point there will be a time where we're losing by having more diversity. So uh, that can be an invasive species or uh, even like, like thistles, some will like those for nutrient cycling, but there there's some plants that won't might reduce yield and then you know you're not getting the intake that you want or the yield that you want from that pasture and certainly from a money standpoint i'm not going to spend for to have every species in the catalog in my pasture mix we look at grazing intake uh, it can be defined as bite rate times bite size by times den stand density equals grass intake so here uh we, we can we can't do much about bite rate. Maybe we could watch our cows closely and figure out who bites more, but I'm not sure if it's genetically uh, transferred to the new new generation. Uh, bite size, we do have a little bit of control. So here's a Normandy cow. They are a strong breed. They have a wider muzzle. There has been some correlation between strength, uh, as as it is on a on judging a cow and the width of the muzzle. So we can increase the bite size, but I don't focus on that too much. What I focus in on is stand density. You know, every bite is full. Uh, they don't have to be searching for, for feed. Uh, it's all the same. You know, that's what I, what I call stand density. And then when you have grass intake, you have content cows. So this is a, a, pa a pasture from way back in the day probably uh, 2008, you know, there's hardly anything there. This grass is in weeds. Uh, I can't believe we even graze pastures like this with dairy cows. Uh, it's it's a testament to how far we've come in, on our grazing management. This is another one. I believe this is a 2013. This was a crop of oats and triticale the year before, 
And then this year, the triticale came up. You know, the, the oats would have died off over winter. And again, in head, very sparse. And I don't know why we're trying to graze dairy cows with this. But uh, you learn from your mistakes and you try to do better in the next years. Uh, we were introduced to pre-clipping from Arden Landis. And uh, so what we do is we go ahead and we clip the pasture and then we put up our temporary wire and let the cows eat the clippings. What this does is it, it levels the, the, the pasture, it creates less refusal, so there, there might be that, that uh, clump of grass that has a manure patty next to it that they'll, they won't eat, but here they'll eat it. And it basically, instead of clipping after the cows, we just clip before. Uh, it does take almost once or at least once a day, you know, going out and clipping ahead. Some people will let it go two days, you know, clip ahead two days, and that can work too. Uh, but looking at this pasture, I'm not sure why we clipped it because you see it's all uniform. Uh, the only thing I can think of is this was a month after Arden told us about the practice, and maybe we were just chomping at the bit to try it. Uh, there are some weeds possibly, but I don't think it's that bad. And looking at this pasture too, uh, since I've seen this pasture, you see how it's all yellow? But there's there's green spots that tells me there's something wrong with the fertilization or something wrong with the fertility of this pasture. Interestingly, this pasture was last fertilized with uh, nitrogen in this the spring uh, of this this year uh, of the pitcher. So this would be March of 2015 and pitcher taken uh, October of 2015. Since this pitcher, this pasture has not looked at this. And the only thing I can conclude is that the, the soil life of this pasture has increased uh, and gotten much better that we don't have these yellow spots. You know, the soil life is feeding this plant. We, we like to haul some slurry over winter on these pastures just to give them a little bit of a, an even coating. Uh, and we have manure that we need to haul. So we do add some manure, but you know, obviously since the, the start of the transition, no no fertilizers, uh, other than maybe gypsum or, or some of the trace minerals. And then we also add a compost. So here's some composting we do. Uh, we're trying to learn about composting. So here we're taking up to almost 160 degrees and then we turn it with our, our forks, with our skid loader. Look at annuals. Uh, we've done sorghum sedan, millet and brassicas and oats and brassicas in the fall and then uh, spring we, we like rye that was planted the fall before. We use them to rotate pastures especially now with uh, the, the transition organic we we're learning not to spray and I don't want to be tilling like, like I said earlier too often so we're using these more closely in a rotation. Uh, in the summer I can plant these crops, uh, graze them and then take them down in August and plant a, a perennial, perennial mix in the fall. Uh, or I can add oats and brassicas and then these will die out over winter and the first thing in spring I can maybe take a quick disc over that and get, get it seeded real quick. I don't need to be doing an intensive tillage operation. And then for that spring I love rye for early grazing. It's the first thing that gets green I can get the cows out a week or two before the perennial pastures are ready to go, and it, it allows me to get the cows out of the barn. We we can use the annuals to boost poor yields uh, in our perennial stands. You know, rotate them out, get something new in. Uh, we've tried interseeding perennial pastures, and it it hasn't worked yet. We're we're playing with maybe adding more quick growing grasses like ryegrass to try to get that to work. But we're we're learning how to keep our stands productive. And then certainly we're going to use the annuals to extend the grazing season. And this is what I'm talking about extending the season. So here we have uh, the blue is, is cereal rye, comes on earlier. It can go real quick, so I graze it real hard. And then when it goes to head, it's either heifer feed or we, we want to uh, put it down and put in the summer annual. And then the summer annuals here in the yellow, you know, they get that boost during the summer. And then the brassicas and oats in the fall. And you'll notice how they, they have stopped growing around November, but we're able to graze December 15th. And that's that 60-day uh, rotation starting in October. 
allows us to ex extend the season. Looking at our pasture yields, uh, 2013 and, and 2015, when I look at my annuals versus my perennials, you know, my annuals are averaging less than my perennials. And I've, I've talked to seed salesmen and people in the know, you know, how, why is this? And I'm not getting any good answers. Uh, I feel I'm grazing my annuals correctly. I graze them not to kill them, but to allow them to, to regenerate and grow, grow back quickly. But I'm still getting less. Uh, the thing is, though, when you look at the averages, the range is, is very wide. So 1.3 tons to 5.6 dry tons an acre. And, and then again in 2015, 2.7 to 5.7. So this 1.3 is not making me any money. It's, it's almost a waste of space. I, I need to do something to get that, get that up. So that's where the annual comes in. You know, the three tons of dry matter in 2013 is less than the 3.7 of the perennial, but it's much better than that 1.3 of that low pasture. Looking at genetics. Uh, what do we want in grazing cow? We want to produce milk and components on a pasture-based system. We need to hold condition on lower energy diets. So again, holding that condition, it's health, it's breeding back, it's foot health, and it's productive life. We we decided to go to crossbreeding. Uh, my dad used the first Jersey bull in the heifer pen in 20 th or 2003. First crossbreeds entered the herd in 2005, which is the time I returned. And then we started using Swedish Red in, in 2007. My dad had used, decided to use uh, Cavanese Holstein on these uh, Jersey Holstein crosses. And then looking at catalogs and seeing some European breeds, I decided to use Swedish Red. And in 2013, we stopped using or breeding for pure Holsteins. We look at the pros and cons. Uh, Crossbreeding is not for everyone. I don't want to bash on the Holsteins, you know. If you're going to graze with Holsteins, it, it can be done. It's, it's being done grass, grass only with Holsteins. Uh, but you know what I'm seeing with the crossbreeding, we have better hybrid vigor. Again, it's health reproduction and lower call rate. Cavanese, especially with the Jersey, feet and legs are better. Uh, that's probably again with the, the hybrid vigor. The components are boosted and the income over feed costs are better. And we'll look at that shortly. The cons of crossbreeding, it's complex. Uh, what are you going to do? What breeds are you going to use? Uh, everyone has a different opinion. The, the sire availability, we're usually dealing with the European breeds. They only have so many sires available. Uh, can they get them to you? D do your salesmen even know what, what to use and how to use it correctly? Uh, another con, we're going to have lower price calves with jerseys. Lower call prices again with Jersey, and a crossbred in general is going to have a lower replacement sale price. So if you're selling heifers to the milking herd, uh, they're not going to bring the money for sure. And it isn't always black and white. Again, a double play. Some people want a black and white cow, uh, but it's not easy. It's, it's complex. And this chart is from a few years ago, it shows the difference between the Holstein and the crossbred. You know, I highlighted the the things for that each benefit in. Holstein is going to have higher milk and protein, uh, but the crossbreds, you know, this is what I showed, uh, higher fat, and this income over feed costs almost $200 a day more income over feed costs, and it goes back to that Jersey eating less intake. Uh, they're, they're going to make maybe a less valued milk, but the intake is going to be that much less. And then calving difficulty, this 0% is not an abnormality. Uh, they really can have easy calves. Jerseys can have a bigger calf than a jersey, and a jersey just stress, stretches different. They're, they're a different type of animal. And then going down to reproduction, uh, better preg rate, better conception rate, uh, less calving interval. Call rate is is much less and uh, cell count especially with jerseys they're not known for a lower cell count so it, it can increase uh, if you're using jersey so what we're doing is using a Frisian uh, we've started to go to New, New Zealand Frisian from the Holstein uh, and 
we we'll use that in a rotation with New, Jer New Zealand jersey and then a Norwegian or Swedish red. Right now, most of my reds are Norwegian because uh, the salesman carries them and I don't have to order them in. We've tried U.S. Halstein, U.S. Jersey, Normandy, Montpelier, and Lineback, and Fleck V. Uh, the U.S. Halstein, you know, what's their strength? Making milk. And my crossbreds out of U.S. Halsteins are not at the top of the list. Uh, furthermore, with the U.S. Jersey, they've, they've done really well, but after using the New Zealand Jersey, I've seen shorter, more compact animals that are right up there with production. And then Normandy, I had high hopes for. They're based on grass, grass-fed only over in, in the beaches of France, you know, that, that lower area that is in the Alps. Uh, but they just had bad feet. Uh, no rhyme or reason. They they just left the herd a little too quickly. They did produce okay. And then Montbilliard was uh, very inconsistent. I had some that were at the top of the herd and then others that were at the bottom of the herd. And then the other two breeds I haven't used too much. Uh, yeah, they're the ones I've used nonetheless. Sire selection. I, with my Holsteins, I want to have a negative stature. They're tall animals, and I want to have the highest DPR and longevity. So I'm looking at these breeds for their strength, and then I'm selecting bulls for their negatives. Uh, Jersey, I, I need to pay extra attention to longevity, longevity and udder depth. You can have uh, Jersey legs and Holstein udders. So we want to keep that udder, udder up off the ground. And then again, the highest DPR bulls. Uh, Norwegian and Swedish red, I'm paying some attention to stature. They're, they're not as tall as a Holstein, but they, they are taller. And then udders. Uh, Norwegian and Swedish, or any of the red breeds, uh, they're very healthy. You know, over in Europe, they need to get a vet to give, them, give a shot. So they don't want to call the vet out, and they want a healthy animal. And you can tell in the, the, the breeds I've been using uh, here. And then New Zealand breeds, I want to pay extra attention to production and udders. Uh, it seems like the New Zealand breeds and udders can be pretty wild, so I'm, I'm looking for those better bulls. And here's a picture of a few of the crosses. We have a Montbeard here in the middle, uh, Jersey Cross, and then here's some linebacks, possibly a pure Holstein there. And just because it's black and white doesn't mean it's Holstein. It could be Norwegian red and Holstein. Looking at labor efficiency, uh, we're, we're, we're looking mostly at the, at the seasonal calving. You know, this is how we're going to save time. It, it allows me to, to focus on the large tasks. So we're going to be breeding, calving, feeding calves. Uh, I can start to prepare for these, these tasks, you know, getting ready for it. There's breaks in between. So, uh, it's not like I'm, I'm constantly feeding calves. Uh, I can feed these these groups of calves quickly. I can feed 28 calves in about a little over half an hour. If I was feeding 10 calves, it'd probably take me 20 minutes. So uh, doing this stuff quickly, preparing for it, getting it done. Parlor efficiency, I want one person to milk while others do the other work. Horde's dairyman put it lightly when I was looking at parlors. They said, if you need to have the second person helping you milk, you're better off building another parlor. Uh, if, if I have someone to help me milk, it takes about an hour and a half, and they'll save me 15 minutes. So they're, they're taking an hour and 15 minutes to save me 15. And then we have to go out and spend another hour or so doing their work that they couldn't get done. So I want one person milking. And our, our parlor has the potential for 70 cows per hour. Uh, if everything's clicking, normally it's about a 60 cow an hour uh, parlor. And then custom hire, custom operators are going to hire labor without the liability or extra expense. They quickly get the job done. We did 1,200 tons of corn silage in about seven hours one day. Uh, the way my dad and my uncle did it back in the day, that would have taken two, two weeks in between the other chores. It, it's less owned equipment, and really it's, you know, less repair bills, uh, less uh, capital investment. Going back to the hired label, I don't need to have a guy that I need to have work to do over winter. You know, I don't need to be paying the extra insurance, health insurance, or liability, or anything else. 
looking closer at, at seasonal calving, you can see the, the, the calendar here. January, we're, we're drying off cows, and we'll get to our lowest number for, for the, the winter, down to maybe 50-some to 60-some. And then February, we start calving. We're finished with calving at the end of March. And I like to calve a little earlier. I want to get this done before breed or before pasture. Uh, I'm not going to be calving these outside, so yeah, I just want to get it done. And then in April, we're, we're going to be milking our peak. And again in May, May will start breeding up, and then June will start drying up cows and finish up breeding. And then the cycle comes back to July and starts up back again with calving in August. The only difference here is we're going to have calves on milk from August to December. Um, but you can tell which, which times of the year we take our, our vacations. So that's January and July. Milking goes real quick, and, yeah, we're, we're able to take our breaks. Looking again at, at feeding calves, so we'll get our calves and we'll start them out on individual buckets, get them to learn to suck, to, to come to the bucket on their own. Uh, then we'll start to group them. So this picture down here on the left, the, the groupings will be based on size, on aggressiveness, at, at sucking, how quickly they can they can drink. So a little jersey that's smaller but drinks real fast, I'll put her in with a, a bigger group. And a, a, like a Holstein size calf that doesn't drink quite as quickly, I might drop her back a group. And then here's the nipple bucket. They all get on there and, you know, it can go real quick. We have our, our utility vehicle here set up that we can haul the milk out. And certainly we have the kids helping. This is our milking parlor. It's a, a parabone. So they come in and go slightly sideways. We milk between the legs. Eight on the side. These swing arms will swing from one side to the other and they drop the unit as they swing. This parlor is, is really nice, but we really overspent for it. I wish I would have seen some of the dairies I've, I've seen since we built this parlor. We could have did it for half the cost. Uh, what we do is we prep and, prep and uh, wipe the first four cows and then come back and attach units. And then we'll do the, the next the last four cows. Uh, strip, dip, come back, wipe, come back, put cows on. By the time we get to the back, uh, we're on, we can come here and, and start on this side. We do the same thing, and by the time we're done with those, these animals over here are coming off, swinging over, put it on. Uh, when we do that that prepping procedure, we get good oxytocin letdown, and I don't want to focus on spending time on the cows milking, so we have the procedure to do it right, and uh, it makes it go quick. And, and we can save on the, the, the quality. You know, I don't need to be focusing on getting cows to milk out that are stripping cows out that might have mastitis. And then here's the custom operators. Uh, we, especially the, the silage, it, it goes so quick. I, I want to have a guy with a lot of weight because the, these loads start coming in and it, it can get backed up in a hurry. The whole operation can cost eight to $900 an hour. But when you're doing over 100 tons an hour, it, it ends up being about eight to nine dollars a ton, which is pretty cheap. You know, looking at that baleage in the back there, you know, I showed you that cost, and and this silage is cheaper than baleage, uh, depending on your volume. Uh, chopping uh, haylage maybe isn't saving as much money as, as a corn silage, just because they can go directly into the crop and go as fast as they need to go. So th this is a, a current work day, especially over winter, a minimum of hours on the job. So I will put in about four, five to six hours. Uh, we have different milking times. We milk later in the morning, so I stumble out of the house at 7, 15, and I'll work till maybe 11, uh, depends on what needs to get done. And that's it for the chores, except for the evening milking. So it's... It would take up to two hours. Right now, we're, we're max cows, and it's it's about two hours. Uh, I've already done it in less than an hour when we're low on cows, down to, to 60-some cows. And then my dad helps out. Uh, he'll put in about four and a half hours. He gets here at 6.30, makes feed, puts it out, and then 
we both finished around the same time at 11. Uh, the only time we, well, I shouldn't say the only time, we, if we have crop work, it'll make us go longer days. So recently we, we were planning and we were both out to 8.30 in the evening, worked pretty much the whole day. If we're doing bailage, you know, it, it can get that late too. But those are hardly five, five days a year where we'll have to do that. So what do we do when we're not working well? I enjoy life, like I said. Uh, so here's my children. We went looking for sheds one year, and we found these in the woods. And then last fall, my daughter was with when I shot this buck. Uh, this is my son down here. This is a fisher caught. We are both on uh, a kayak we got last fall. So my kids love fishing, and I love taking them fishing. So we're going to do that as much as we can. This lure that he's holding there is one I actually made, so I've been getting into that. And the kids love helping too. And then here's a picture of all three of them. They're a little younger there, but on the skid litter with me. I find it's the safest place for a kid is on the skid litter. That way they're not coming up to me while I'm running it, and who knows, they could be behind me. Um, and then here on the bottom left, they're, we were feeding calves, and they decided to get, go to the raspberry patch. So no problem. It's, it's fun seeing them all doing the same thing. So if you have any questions, feel free to free to email me. Like I said, you know, I can report this to the GLC and it gets passed on to NRCS and lets people people in NRCS know that we're talking about this. Uh, I love answering questions, so feel free to, to call or to to email me. And if you need any other help, uh contact your local NRCS or grazing groups. Grazing groups are a great way to, to learn more about grazing. Uh, I started one in Lebanon County and we're growing. It seems like we, we have a conference every year and you can learn more by getting your boots dirty on a farm than you can, you know, listening to me or, or calling me on the phone. So take care and happy grazing.